So welcome to BT Centre if you've not been here before or if it's uh, your, your multiple time here. Uh, it's our pleasure to host and can I just thank Veronica and Tim who worked tirelessly for the UK IPv6 Council and put a lot of time into this. So thanks to them. They, they're always the thankers and not the thankees. So I uh, uh, just want to uh, call that out. Um, next slide, please. Oh, I should say who I am. Nick Heatley, I'm a network architect. I'm in the Chief Architect's Office of BT. When I started this role um, many years ago, the company was called One to One, if you remember those days. Uh, and then the name changed a number of times, and here I am in BT, in the Chief Architect's Office. Uh, so I've been responsible for the EE IPv6 rollout, and I can also talk a little bit about BT as well. So um, I've got a clicker, haven't I? I can do this. I'm in control. Um, so BT IPv6 on business broadband. Uh, support was added on business broadband in 2017. Uh, so business have a, uh, an option to uh, support a slash 56 uh, as a static. And we've got high-speed internet and VPN services enabled with IPv6. That's been there for several years. Uh, nothing new here if you've been to the previous um, annual meetings. Uh, consumer. So since October 2016, the network rollout was completed. Um, so we've got it across all broadband lines with the exception of IP stream, the legacy connections, which I'm told are about, well, less than half a percent of, of actual customer connections now and dropping every month. So they are um, extreme legacy. Um, it's supported by the BT Consumer Smart Hub today. Um, so we can see uh, the, the rollout in the next couple of slides. Uh, the new news really is the, the Smart Hub 2. This was launched in November 2018. So um, BT um, have made the commitment to support IPv6 dual stack on every new, new hub and the Smart Hub 2 is no exception. Um, so it comes on BT Plus, which is a subscription which packages up with, uh, with mobile services, including a, um, a guarantee to keep you online and um, the Wi-Fi guarantee, which is quite interesting with Smart Hub 2. There's a Wi-Fi extender, um, so you can uh, guarantee the Wi-Fi performance in your, in your house, no matter how large a mansion you might possess, you lucky people. Um, so on BT, uh, that's the current status. We're going to APNIC there for our Stats from the public domain, the, the, current, the common currency for, for IPv6 stats. So you can see from 2016, we're, um, we're up around 40%. Um, there's a little anomaly at the end there where it's dropped down again. Um, people are looking into what that anomaly is, but the belief is that it's an apneic uh, stats issue um, because it doesn't occur on other other um, stats uh, in the public domain, uh, nor have we seen that or identified that in our network itself. So, uh, strange little anomaly. Uh, I don't know whether anyone's got any concrete proof of what's happening there, but I don't think it's real. Um, moving on to the EE update. Um, so, um, so we, we switched on IPv6 only for internet services. This is available on EE consumer post-pay, so the pay monthly customers with an eligible device. We switched that on in 2016, um, last, last quarter of 2016, I think. Um, and prior to that, we've been running IPv6 on voice over LTE and voice over Wi-Fi, which is an internal bearer within the EE core. Um, and then we went on to the internet services. So, the eligible handsets were Android-based uh, for the 464X LAT support. Ooh, tick that off. Um, I could come up with a sentence with about 12 of them. You know, do I, could, I, could I engineer this so I win? I, don't, I think I should be struck off. 
Um, so until um, we saw a surge in IPv6 only usage on EE, um, in September 2018, iOS 12 was on general release. Um, and look what happened. So you can see us, us going up from the sort of 10 to 15 percent. We're, we're now um, well above 40 percent. Um, um, I think it will probably stabilize around there. So these are the, the public domain um, information on, on, on the EEAS, which is separate currently from, from the main BTAS. It's also a mix of mobile, predominantly mobile, but some fixed services there. Um, so I can actually say that on the EEAPN, it's beyond 50%. We've got beyond 50% on IPv6. So these stats are, are kind of diluted a little bit by the fixed, um, which also seems to have a he heavier weighting with uh, APNIC um, uh, stats as well. So that's a major milestone, getting beyond 50%. And because it's IPv6 only, we've seen our address, IPv4 address usage drop right down on mobile. Um, so why IPv6 in cellular networks? Well, for us it was about avoiding IPv4 address exhaustion. So we have 30 plus million customers and there's 20 million private addresses. So either you go into a world of dividing, um, uh, going into overlapping address space and all the mess that that can lead to with multiple layers of, of NAT, or you look to use a global addressing system. Um, the actual address numbers, the, the, the crunch was getting, getting harsher. So originally, if you think about the, the, the early mobile services, then they were not always on. Um, and then we started to see with 4G LTE that a, a device would be always on, always IP connected, and that device would not go into idle mode. It would not hand back an IP address on the network. It was there to be paged permanently by the network. On that, on that address. And then also add in voice over LTE as a separate bearer, and you've now got multiple IP addresses per device. So this, this, this IP address crunch was just, was just getting worse and worse. Um, and when you think about the long-term strategy, including Internet of Things, now not every Internet of Thing uh, will be on a mobile network for sure, but, but still there's a, there's a high impact uh, and a high desire to, to start connecting things up over cellular. So um, having more address space is always going to be useful for strategically. There are some other benefits, um, but I'll not go through those today. So we um, went into an IPv6 transition with 464X LAT, um, which is a, a technology that's been standardized in the IETF. It's, uh, standardized against RFC 6877. It's a translation-based system, so it uses a NAT. Um, now, we already extensively use NAT in, in mobile. Um, so, as I've said, we're using private address space to service all these handsets. Um, so, we've already got a CGN in there. So, this fits the, the network architecture. And 464X LAT uh, is an IPv6 only technology from the sense that the cellular network, the cellular core only has to give out an IPv6 address to devices. Um, so it avoids IPv4 exhaustion. We get to run a pure IPv6 uh, only network in the, in the access and in the core. Um, so 464X LAT, it, it makes use of stateful NAT and a stateless client that sits on the device, they're called the CLAT. Um, you need to uh, have some discovery mechanism so that the, the device itself can work out the address of the NAT64, the, the, the gateway for translated traffic. Um, but we're seeing this being picked up by many, many mobile uh, carriers. So there's a list there. Um, 464X LAT deployments must be approaching um, over 150 million mobile customers, I, I would suggest now, because we've got the likes of the US players and then Reliance Geo, which is a massive player in India, and ourselves in, in UK. Um, just a 
quick recap on what mobile use cases we pick up. So voice IMS we've talked about, it's basically a closed user group. Uh, so IPv6 was, was a simple um, challenge uh, in that sense. As you move on to the data services and internet services, then you're dealing with services on the internet that may or may not be IPv6 enabled. So you need some sort of backwards compatibility solution, which is what 464 XLAP brings you. We needed to support data direct from the handset, so uh, an app running on the handset itself, and we needed to support tethering, so the idea of taking a, a laptop and connecting it to the, to the Wi-Fi that's hanging off the, um, off the cellular device. So those are the key use cases that we picked up with 464 XLAP. Um, quick overview of 464 XLAT. Um, so it's all about understanding how a device will, will get connected to content. So a device, um, or, or let's say the app on the device, it could be agnostic to IP version. So for example, it could do a DNS lookup and it would let the, the DNS response tell it uh, to go to an IPv4 or an IPv6 address. So um, NAT64, DNS64 is a way of, in the network, um, ensuring that those apps can get connected. So a DNS64 can spoof um, uh, an IPv4 um, A record, uh, spoof it as a, as a quad A and send it down to the, to the device. So the device can connect over IPv6 and and go through a NAT64 and get to the content. Um, so it's kind of agnostic, the app, would, if it's using DNS. If there's the case that the app itself is IPv4 bound, then we have an issue. The network itself cannot solve that use case. So an IPv4 bound app might be looking for an IPv4 address without a DNS lookup, uh, a so-called IPv4 literal. Um, other cases could be that there's bad web programming where you're being passed um, to a, a URL which is not a true FQDN but has an IPv4 uh, address in, embedded in that URL. Uh, so again, that's, that's going to be locked to IPv4. The app itself is looking for an IPv4 destination. If it's IPv6 only enabled, then that should fail. Now 464XLAT comes along. We put a CLAT on the device. Um, and that C light is this stateless translator. So it convinces the apps that it has a working IPv4 stack. Uh, you'll see a dummy address on these devices, 192.0.0.4. And that's the dummy stack that exists on every C light device. Um, so the, the app itself thinks, ah, I've got a working IPv4 connection. The C light translates it to IPv6 fires it off to the NAT64, same as DNS64, and then the NAT64 can translate it back to, uh, to the V4 content. Um, and the joy of 464XLAT is it's a backwards compatibility technique, but IPv6 is unaffected. If you've got an IPv6 destination, you're, you're using pure IPv6, no question asked. Um, so this is what we've used. Um, this was supported on Android devices first and foremost from Android 4. Um, and now um, we've seen uh, Apple start to, to use 464X Latin in a specific case. So they're both using 464X Lat, but the impl implementations are very different. So Android is awesome because They've imp uh, implemented 464XLAT both for onboard uh, applications and for the tethering use case. Um, so both of those traffic types, or, um, yeah, traffic types will go um, via the, the, the CLAT. Uh, Apple are awesome because they've, um, they've actually been policing the App Store and getting ready for for, for IPv6 only, getting all applications in their app store IP agnostic. Um, so removing the literals that you might see in the apps and testing those, forcing developers to actually test and make sure that their, their application is agnostic. Um, 
So they use 464X like just for the tethering use case. Um, so where there's an unknown OS hanging off a, an iOS device, then they can provide an IPv4 connection um, on the Wi-Fi. And then it gets translated just the same. Um, so they also do some other cool stuff um, with Happy Eyeballs V2. Um, we've got a bump in the host approach and the OS can start to heal and fix any literals that might be uh, seen in, uh, you know, in the OS stack. So perhaps if your browser is, 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 um, is um, repaired, then um, if you type a, a literal into that browser, then the, uh, the OS can, can, can fix that. So uh, that is the overview. Um, thank you very much. Are there any, any questions on that? What it means really for us is that, um, you know, I was just thinking about uh, Jen's statement there about, um, uh, you know, urgency and importance of IPv6. Um, I wanted to get IPv6 rolled out for 4G and um, we had an urgent demand to, to, to get 4G out there and IPv6 was basically put on the back burner. We finally got it in there, but what it means for 5G is that we can go IPv6 only from day one. IPv4 will be a service that we just need to add on to an IPv6 only network. Um, we're in a really good position there, um, and I think others might have to catch up on that. So if there's any questions, Tim's got the problem of getting the mic to you. As you see traffic going IPv6 native instead of going through the NAT, does that represent a reduction in cost for you? Yes, it does. Um, so basically, we're, we're paying for NAT gateways, um, and they're labor intensive in CPU. Um, what we see at the moment is about 70% of a, of a if, you, if you enable IPv6 on a device, then about 70% of that traffic is is native IPv6. So that's, that's, address, uh, that's traffic that doesn't need to be NATed. Um, obviously, we've invested in NAT gateways and, and we still have um, firewalling between ourselves and the internet or customers and the internet, um, but the, the NAT overhead is removed. And so we will see in the long term that we won't need to uh, invest as heavily in, uh, in, these, in, in these gateway devices. So you you'd encourage content providers to provide their content on v6 because that makes yours and other networks uh, lives easier yeah absolutely and and um, what what we would say was that you know CGN is going to become a daily problem in the future you know C CGN is 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 all about um, you know, ratios of uh, addresses to customers, and the, the, the harsher it goes, the, uh, the, the poorer the service, to be, to be honest. So getting content onto V6 is crucial going forward. And that's, you know, if you don't like 464 XLAT, if you don't like DNS 64, there's one simple answer for everyone, and that's start implementing dual stack on content, because the IPv6 path is pure and, and unadulterated. So, absolutely. Hi. So, so another, uh, yeah. um, do you, how do you switch on the, or what switches on the CLAT step in the handset? Because that's the thing that needs to change in, in the handset. It, does it do this automatically if there is no IPv4 stack available on the interface or do you have to do something? And the other question is, do you allow inbound IPv6 traffic unsolicited UDP, TCP for peer-to-peer -peer connectivity, or do you firewall that off in order to emulate the perceived security of NAT? Yeah, so the first question, um, so obviously the CLAT is part of the standard um, handset OS, so it's, it's, it's built in, it's mainstream, so there's no, no issue there. Um, it, it wakes up when it finds itself on an IPv6 only cellular network. It, is, um, it, it does seem to be dependent on the, the, the cellular interface. So I, I, I'm not sure it's been enabled on Wi-Fi, for example, but it's enabled on the cellular interface. If it finds itself in IPv6 only mode, 
then it goes and, and, and checks to find the NAT64 gateway. And then it's, then it's set up and ready to go. So it does that automatically on, on Android devices, yeah. yeah. Inbound? Inbound, yeah. Um, so we're, we're firewalling. Uh, we still see the need to, to firewall uh, traffic um, because um, it, it, it's a nuisance for customers because it, it eats up their data allowance if they get a lot of spam and, and unsolicited traffic. But it also creates a lot of flux in the radio network. So we, we still firewall. We find that most um, appli applications in the consumer space know about NATs, know about Keeper Lives, can, can, can work around the NAT in the various ways. So it doesn't affect any, any uh, streaming or, or comms type applications. You know, the, the, the application writers are smart enough to get around this. But um, in, in certain business cases, then, um, then perhaps it, it, it might be uh, less desirable. So we would, would look to do an option to, to have that unsolicited for business customers. We haven't switched on IPv6 only for business. And that's one of the reasons why we, we would look at it as a different, a different use case from consumer. Do you think that's here to stay, the inbound block, in the long term? Um, it's a good question. I think it probably needs to be reviewed in, in, the, uh, in, in, in the context of 5G. Um, it's certainly here for 4G. Okay, thank you. We need to move on. So thanks again, Nick, for uh, an excellent talk. Thank you. Okay, and uh, next up is uh, Loba from Virgin Stroke Liberty Global, who's going to just talk briefly about um, how they're doing their rollout, um, some explanation of DS Lite, um, briefly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, briefly. So, over to you, Loba. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I'm glad to be here today. Yeah, my name is um, Lobo Lopade. I'm from Virgin Media, which is now part of... Um, Liberty Global. We've been part of Liberty Global now for like about um, five years, I think since 2013. And yeah, I've been technical lead for the IPv6 broadband rollout in Virgin Media UK. Just, um, yep. This is not meant to be a political map. <laughs> 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 yeah, but it's meant to show the um, countries where Liberty Global are in Europe. And um, the reason why the UK is there in red is, as the next slide would show, is uh, Liberty Global already has an um, IPv6 rollout, broadband services across Europe. So on that map, UK at the moment is the only one where we don't have um, IPv6 broadband services. Um, on the rest of the countries there, we already have um, IPv6 um, broadband services. So our deployment across Europe, um, at the moment we have like about 4.5 million customers using IPv6 um, across Europe. We widely use um, DS Lite, which I will get to later on um, in our deployment. And we do do dual stack in some countries as well. Some of the countries have a mix of um, DS Lite and, and dual stack across that. Um, in the UK, oh, yeah, just quick one. I think I expect that to be a question that would come up. The reason why um, Liberty Global has been choosing to use DS Lite. Um, one is, as a lot of us would know, DS Lite is an IPv6 transition technology, right? And it solves the IPv4 depletion issue, right? So when you run out of IPv4 addresses, just going full door stack would not um, solve that problem. That's one of the key reasons why we've, we've gone the way of, um, of DS Lite. Now, one of the big advantage for us for DS Lite is that of the transition technologies that is out there, it is available right now. We can get it on the CPE, we can get it on the AFTLs, we can get it out there, we can deploy, which is why across Europe we already have that um, available being deployed across. And from a network and deployment perspective, the changes required on the network, the integrations into the service provider network, where a cable operator 
integration into the cable operation, it's quite, quite easy, quite, quite simple, right? So it's an easy step to just get um, IPv6 broadband services out there um, in the network. Um, there is a presentation, I think, that was done earlier on in the year. If you want to see a little bit more about um, implementation considerations, you can check out that link, right? And if you want to kind of have a quick understanding of this, like this diagram is just kind of meant to kind of imply that, right? It's basically a mix of a tunneling technology applied with them um, with CGNAT, where you are able to um, get native IPv6 on your CPE, native IPv6 on the home device on your LAN, so you have native IPv6 going out from your home devices down to the internet when you want to reach a native IPv6 website. But if it's an IPv4, then you can create a tunnel that will start, an IP and IP tunnel that will start all the way from the CPE and go all the way down to a carrier grid NAT device, which they call the AFTR, Address Family Transmission Router, right? So you get all the V4 traffic tunneled across that IPv6 tunnel down to the um, AFTR and then the AFTR does the carrier grid NAT translation and then pff, goes to the internet. And that will be the pathway for the, um, um, for the IPv4. Most ISPs these days would deploy an MPLS network right there somewhere on the core of their network, which means really what you would have is IPv6 over MPLS then blah, blah, blah. Yeah, well, that, that basically is um, what DSLI does, right? Um, in my view, my opinion, right, quite simple to deploy and um, easy to integrate, which is the reason why um, we've kind of gone with it um, in the Liberty Global Network. Um, in the UK, which is, I get what we're interested in here, um, about two, three years ago, um, we started the upgrade of the network to support IPv6 services. Um, I think the first key driver for us then was um, when we had to deploy a new voice network. Um, we call it Transform CV internally. I'm not sure what we call it um, as a product. Um, we then made a decision that the new voice network wasn't going to be based on IPv4, right? It was going to be based on IPv6 services, and um, basically voice over IP, right? And we upgraded the core of the network at the time to support IPv6. So the current, our new voice product actually runs on IPv6, which means that our entire core infrastructure as of today as um, is supporting um, IPv6. The next step for us was to then deploy IPv6 broadband services, which is kind of where we are at the moment. Um, we've been doing testing, I think, of the broadband services. I can't go into too much details of that. Yeah, but um, there's been a number of trials and testing, both staff trials and customer testing that has gone on. And um, we are open, really open, that we're going to have a product launch um, very, very, very soon. Um, I can't give you any particular time, <laughs> but very, very soon. Um, I think that's it. Thank you. Any questions? Loba? Oh, sorry. Uh, I thought I was getting off free. <laughs> <laughs> Hi there, Terry from Queen Mary. Um, a few years ago, I was at a right meeting. No, no, sorry, it wasn't a right meeting. It was a UK NOF meeting. And uh, they always have a panel of like the larger ISPs in the UK. Uh, concerning, and, and IPv6 was mentioned, and the reason why Virgin hadn't, when they were Virgin, not Liberty Global, when, why they hadn't deployed v6 yet was because the, I quote, the security guys wouldn't let them turn it on. Is that still a, a concern? <laughs> <laughs> Is that still a concern? Is that still something that could uh, impede your rollout? Um, no, I don't think so. I'm not sure I have the background to security guys not letting go on. As you would know, in any organization, there's always trying to justify PV6 services. It's, you know what I mean? Yeah. Right. And so there might have been some, somebody in security that maybe raised an issue of one particular concern and stuff. But I think we've passed a stage, right? We've 
like I mentioned, we already have um, the voice network on IPv6. We already have some kind of trials going on on the broadband, right? So we've passed that stage in which we're trying to somewhat in security saying can be turned on. So no, I don't think that that is a situation right now. I look forward to exchanging V6 traffic with you. Same, yeah. <laughs> Hi, great to hear that, that you're pressing ahead with this, but I do have a bit of concern. What happens to the customers using their router in modem-only mode whose devices don't support L um, DS Lite? Because it's not that commonly supported. Yeah, it is not commonly supported, and that's been kind of an internal debate that we've had. Um, at the moment, what we're thinking of doing is that modem-only will not be supported, primarily because uh, of availability of routers that support DS Lite, right? If there were, as in, off-the-shelf routers from Corizo, Peace Water, anywhere. If that was readily available, where we know the customers can pick up a device, right, and then decide um, to turn on the modem mode and their broadband will still work, then we're kind of willing to support it. But with the unavailability of those devices, we're thinking that the best way forward will be to turn off the modem mode, turn on support for modem mode. But it's not cast in stone yet. The other possibility, though, I mean, one of the advantages that IPv6 gives you is that um, uh, because um, I think from Nick's um, description earlier on, it was showing you the different slash 56 and stuff, right? So it's quite possible for you to still put your router in front of our router, our, our CPE, because our CPE will give you a slash 56 for your entire LAN. So prefix delegations would allow your CPE to get another I think it's slash 61, if I remember correctly, for you to then reallocate on your local LAN. So the fact that the, mo the CPE can go in the modern mode does not stop you from actually still putting your CPE in there if you know what you're doing. Great, thank you. Yeah, quick one. Um, other ISPs have provided details and statistics on the percentage of their customers that are supported. Do you have any, um, at the moment, any forecasts or any data um, to be able to share on how many of your customers will be able to use IPv6 in the next six months, year, etc., and how many of the, uh, what percentage of the CPEs are uh, IPv6 compatible um, for, uh, I guess, what's virgin at the moment? Um. It, it would depend on the product launch, right? More of how the product teams decide to, well, I would try to influence them or not to. I mean, there are different options, right? So I can give you a definite answer, right? The CPUs that we have on the network right now, the main CPUs would support it. So it would depend on how the network, how we plan to do, whether our new customers only, or we have a fixed migration, right, where you migrated and stuff like that. You know, what is critical for us is not to affect the customer, right? What we want to do is to be able to upgrade customers or have new customers and they will not realize we're turning on IPv6, right? Because most people are not techies and understand, they just don't want internet. So you don't want to kind of stop that. You want them to just have a similar service. So it's really gonna depend on that. So it's, it's not much of a technical answer, which I can give, it's more of a business answer which I can't give, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Loba. Thank you. So really exciting to see the presentation from Virgin here, um, because we've been trying to get you to talk to us for many years, and uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing the UK numbers going up again for IPv6. So now the last one is, guys, we have to get here talk talk, okay? Because they are the last large uh, broadband provider who so far have not shared any plans. But right now, let's focus on Matthew from Liquid Telecom, who is going to talk about their deployment. And Matthew, you'll have to explain to us uh, how come you are here in the UK, but you are bringing Africa to IPv6. Okay, so the secret is out. <laughs> So when, we, when in Africa, when we are not uh, hunting or viewing game or basking in the sun, now you know what we'll be doing, <laughs> IPv6. <laughs> so yeah, um, my name is Matthew Chigwende. I head up the Liquid Telecom Group uh, Engineering. 
Uh, my mother told me, uh, you know, wherever you go, and if I go out without your brains. So I always bring my colleague, Kathleen, with me because he's there to answer any questions that you might have. So Kathleen um, looks after team leads, our engineering team in London. So the way we structured uh, in Liquid Telecom, we have about 40, um, 14 operating companies, of which uh, the London office uh, looks after um, the engineering, and there's a bit of operations here in London, but uh, all the customers and uh, uh, operating companies are in Africa. So we have got about 2,500 uh, 2, employees, of which uh, all of them are distributed in about 14 different countries in Africa. So just going to give a, a quick overview of uh, what we are doing in um, in around uh, Africa. Oh, is this one? So Liquid Telecom, uh, we are Africa's largest independent uh, fiber network, which runs uh, all the way from Cape Town uh, in South Africa down there, uh, all the way to Cairo in Egypt. So what, what shows on the map here is our fiber network coverage. We are approaching about 70,000 70, kilometers uh, of um, fiber, most, mostly which is uh, on net and our services is mostly providing internet services and we are now uh, also into the cloud space and uh, we support ISPs around all the, the area, areas we are, we are operating in. And our ambition really is to connect all of Africa. So uh, just a brief about the Liquid Telecom Network. We are, we support a truly multi-vendor network. Uh, well, we use all the, all the Chinese, all the European, all the American uh, pieces of equipment that we can get. Um, we have a one, -way, one network across all our operating uh, countries. Actually, we've got our AS number from RIPE. Um, and uh, 30844 is our AS number that we have, um, we use throughout all Africa. But however, one thing to note is that uh, Liquid Telecom has grown through acquisitions as well. So there will be some uh, op op operating companies out there that are still using the native AS, like, like the, our biggest operating company right now is in South Africa. We're still using the, their old AS number and we are s slowly uh, or carefully uh, integrating them into the 30844 operating. So we've got uh, multiple metro networks, of course, one for, for every um, operating company. So our IPv6 approach uh, is very simple. It's not, uh, it's not optional. We just set up our network and have the core running IPv6 just like we run IPv4. Maybe we're lucky that uh, Liquid Telecom is not a... Um, is a relatively uh, new company because we set up our core network or MPLS in 2009, 2010. So by then we actually knew what uh, other ISPs or the bigger ISPs their problems were and we knew about this depletion of IPv4. So we just, from the onset, we knew that we were going to visit IPv6 at some point. IPv6 first. Uh, dual stack is what, is, is what we do. We have our V4 and we have our V6. So uh, on our backbone, everything has IPv6. And our in-country core, we have V4 and V6 and our on the metro as well. So uh, from, from, every, from every metro network, we can, uh, we can have pseudo, wire, uh, pseudo wires um, because we've got lots of this business of uh, country to country uh, list circuits. So we can connect from one country to another and all our core uh, up to the metro is also um, V6 enabled. On the, on the V6 itself, uh, one thing uh, that uh, 
has helped us to make sure that we always have V6 is that uh, the ISIS single topology. Because if we don't have the single topology, then uh, it will mean that if, you, if an engineer forgets to configure V6 on your point-to-point -point links, then your LDP or ISIS will never come up. So this, is, uh, this has made it easier for us to know that for every engineer is like uh, wired to know that the moment you put a core network point to point, it's V4 and V6. So it's just part of our nature. And also on, on V6 um, transport protocol is BGP. Uh, we are also playing around with uh, segment routing now. And uh, IPv6 becomes very important. We, yeah, we are deploying segment routing at the moment uh, in non-preferred mode for, uh, for all the core. But um, as soon as, or as, as, as we get more and more um, supported devices in any operating country, we are preparing uh, segment routing in preferred mode. So we, our, our journey has been um, very simple. So in 2006, well, well we, be, we thought of uh, our big network as it is today. Uh, we had one, one uh, engineer was working for us and I uh, was a student and he had this uh, MSC project which was uh, on V6. So he started uh, playing around and, con and uh, configuring our core. I mean, it was just tech, it wasn't going to break anything, so it didn't really matter. And um, th th then we had it all. Then um, around 2010, we started rolling our MPLS in Africa. And also we had some, some ties with, uh, you know, the likes of Hurricane Electric, who were like really pushing us to have V6 as well. Who were Oh, actually, I see one of them here. <laughs> okay, so some advocates were like um, working with us and um, we were deploying V6. Um, so what, uh, around 2010, when we started rolling out MPLS, it was all in, on, our, on our core. But one thing we, we made sure is whenever we give our, a customer IP transit, we always ensured that we gave them IPv6 as well. Even if they didn't need it, it was part of the configuration. And uh, we always um, encouraged them or offered some, some, some tutorials as well to, the, to their key engineers so that they would work with us. Then around uh, 2012, we, our network started expanding from Southern Africa into, into East Africa. And our core still was um, IPv6. Um, enabled Geostack. But things started really changing in 2016 when uh, our clients, when we enabled IPv6 on our clients, Geostack on our clients, on Jeep on clients, um, we, we realized, of course, that uh, there was no way we could get uh, enough IP addresses from uh, Afrinic. So we, we really had to start pushing this to the edge. So that's where we started seeing some real uptake of, uh, of traffic on IPv6 traffic. Then today, uh, we, we have some implementations on uh, all our edge customers, GPON, LTE, IP Transit, um, of course, and then our Wi-Fi, um, commercial Wi-Fi, we are, we are making sure that we're having a dual stack there. And um, we are also looking at ways of um, going IPv6 uh, native. Not yet done, but that's, we know that's uh, where, where we are going. I, just, to, just to know some of, the, some of the brands we have. So we, we, our, um, we have Zimbabwe online. In Zimbabwe, Zo is our Zimbabwe online brand. So this you won't see on our, three, on our AS number 30844, but it's part of uh, Liquid Telecom Group, the ISPs that we support. And we have our, our, other, our other brand called Hi, that's uh, operating uh, retail brand that operates in Kenya, Rwanda, Zimbabwe, yeah, Zambia, Uganda, and Tanzania. Uh, so 
across our, our vendor BNGs, we have um, Geostack, PPPOE for the authentication. IPOE is what we think uh, might be necessary and we, we might uh, not using today, but uh, we, we, we will consider doing that. Um, on the roadmap now, we are looking at um, translation methods. And um, what I've seen here uh, with the earlier presentations is quite encouraging as well. That's, that's, that's the good thing about not being a leader in the market or being a slightly a step behind. You can always see what all these other guys are doing. <laughs> where, <laughs> where they have failed especially, then you just say, OK, we just avoid that. You know what, we can never live long enough to, um, uh, to, to make all the mistakes, but at least we can learn from some other people's mistakes. So um, this is uh, Africa's IPv6 um, capability. Um, uh, I mean, a courtesy of uh, Statslet uh, APNIC. So, so you see, uh, this is Eastern Africa. Uh, this, this is the graph for the uptake of uh, IPv6, IPv6 capability for, for Eastern Africa. And you can see from there that things started really changing around um, October 2015 there. And, um, and one interesting thing as well is that this um, uh, Eastern, Africa, ma uh, Eastern Africa region kind of uh, correlates to the Liquid Telecom uh, network. So this is the region that we, we operate in mostly. Um, this is the country Zimbabwe. Uh, in 2016, you can actually see there was a, like, like, a, like a jump uh, in the IPv6 capability and IPv6 preference. And regrettable to say, I mean, it has been alluded that uh, people enable IPv6, uh, they're excited about it and it starts working, but then it starts falling. And um, we were not really monitoring this. Uh, now that I'm here and uh, on the spot, now I have to answer all the questions. Why is it that <laughs> at the end it's... <laughs> um, Catalin has not prepared the answers for, for, for that today, but uh, please don't ask it because we'll give an answer this time next year. Um, so, so, so the reason for, for the increase here or for the sudden, uh, for the, for the sudden shoot is, um, is that in October 2016, Zimbabwe Online, one of our subsidiary, our commercial branch in Africa, in uh, Zimbabwe, actually activated IPv6 on their GPON. About um, 50,000 homes are covered, but the actual deployment use is um, around half that. So this is only in Zimbabwe. Uh, we, asked, we are doing a lot of uh, work and activation, so GPON, so far, 22,000 is activated in, uh, in Zimbabwe. Rwanda and Kenya, there are small deployments, but uh, in fact, uh, Kenya, and Kenya is actually much bigger country than Zimbabwe. So as soon as these deployments are, um, are active, you are going to see something um, probably three times bigger than Zimbabwe when, Ke when Kenya rollout is done. Zambia, we're starting on the LTE. Uh, we have not, um, uh, V6 is not, is not, uh, is, is not uh, enabled at the moment. So it's actually work in progress. We're just working with that. So we're going to expect a lot of um, uh, V6 usage uh, fro fro from Zambia as well. Uh, we have not included uh, South Africa at the moment because we are still in the in integration. Um, they are no, there is no, uh, V6 to the edge on our South African operations. So, but uh, in terms of the size of South Africa, it's actually much bigger than the whole of Liquid Telecom put together in terms of customers connected. So if, now we know how to do it. So if we do enable South Africa, you're gonna be expecting a lot of IPv6 usage in, uh, in the Southern Africa. So uh, just, just on the outlook, 
uh, for Liquid Telecom, what we are looking for in the future, we are still going to invest in looking at um, a lot of inf infrastructure growth. And um, I've talked of the Cape to Cairo network, and this is our, our vision for Africa in terms of connectivity. We just want to connect everything everywhere. So IPv6 will become more and more important. Uh, mostly, we know that um, there won't be any more um, IP, IPv6. So in terms of what, what we do, our hardware architecture is uh, we, we want to make sure, we always make sure that it's, it always supports um, IPv6, I mean the core certainly, and now we, want to, we are pushing that on the edge. And I think one thing that was slowing us down in Africa was because uh, there's, there was so much, there's too much IPv4 being given by Afrinic. So now I'm glad that uh, we are, those IPv4s are being depleted so people start thinking seriously about IPv6. Um, and and, and uh, we also want to, to keep following the technology. Like, like I said, we, we are listening very carefully to what other people have done. We've seen some deployments, especially the BT ones. Those are things that we want to, uh, to keep tracking and, 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 and following. I'll just uh, leave you with, um, with, with uh, one uh, video about uh, Africa. There is a core belief at the heart of Liquid Telecom. The belief that every individual has the right to be connected. The pursuit of this vision has seen us build the largest independent fiber network in Africa, from Cape to Cairo. We are connecting more of Africa. Liquid Telecom, building Africa's digital future. So that's Liquid Telecom. That's us. That's, um, and our playground is um, Africa. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any quick questions before we move on to the Jim Bound Awards? I think it's really excellent to, to see IPv6 now happening in, in Africa as well. And it's, in terms of a global picture, then you know, it increases the, you know, the case for us to be deploying v6 here as well. If you know, we're going to have people in Africa that maybe have v6-only deployments, and it's the most robust way of giving them access to our resources is by us deploying v6 as well. Absolutely. One question from ISOC. Yeah, thank you. Um, um, the Internet Society is, is very much uh, involved with a lot of connectivity projects and so on in Africa, including community connectivity projects. But one of the um, big debates that is uh, that we often have is w when speaking about IPv6 is that, oh, well, it's more expensive. Right now, what Africa needs is just connectivity, and it doesn't need IPv6. W what is your reaction to this? Uh, like, like I said, um, we don't treat IPv6 differently. And um, depletion of IPv4 uh, is for everyone. One, one good thing about uh, internet protocol in general, or connectivity in general, is that it doesn't matter where you are, or wh what part of the globe you are. If I'm going to, co to have a point-to-point -point connection with you, we have to agree on the IP addresses, we have to agree on the routing protocol, we have to agree on everything. And possibly we have to use the same sort of hardware, software, or, or feature set. So wherever you are sitting, be it in Europe, in Africa, in Asia, the connectivity has to be the same. So the, our only, our only um, so the video actually t was telling a, what we need in Africa is to have that infrastructure, infrastructure on. Once the infrastructure is up, I mean, we have to, con we have to link uh, match protocols with everyone else. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much again.